Today, we are delighted to have Trent Brown to discuss So the Hefners Left Macomb. The book, originally published in 1965, is Greenville journalist Hodding Carter's account of the events that led the Hefner family to abruptly leave their town during the height of the civil rights struggle in the state. The Hefner story demonstrates the forces of fear, conformity, communal pressure, and threats of retaliation that silenced so many white Mississippians during the 50s and 60s. Trent Brown is Associate Professor of American Studies at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He is author of three books, including With Ed King, Ed King's Mississippi, Behind the Scenes of Freedom Summer. I saw Ed King yesterday, by the way, and he wanted me to make sure that you knew, and it's good for everybody to hear, that uh, he has a Wednesday engagement. He's going to come in late, he hopes, but he's not boycotting it for you. <laughs> A native of Macomb, Brown holds a PhD in history from the University of Chicago. He is the editor of the University Press of Mississippi's new Civil Rights in Mississippi reprint series, off which So the Hefners Left Macomb is the initial volume. Help me welcome Trevor. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all so much for coming out. Um, let me thank particularly Chris Goodwin and the other folks here at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History who do a fantastic job providing these opportunities for authors and audiences. Um, let me also thank the University Press of Mississippi. I've met a couple of their representatives here today. Um, the publishers of this book and the University Press of Mississippi is a very rich resource for this state, and they do outstanding service to the cause of scholarship. Uh, their work is nationally and internationally recognized and deserves your support. Um, Craig Gill and Steve Yates and everybody else there do fantastic work. Um, as Chris mentioned, our subject today is Hotting Carter II's book, So the Hefners Left Macomb. It was originally published, as Chris mentioned, in 1965, and it is um, the first title in our Civil Rights in Mississippi reprint series. Um, other titles will follow beginning this fall. William McCord's Mississippi, The Long Hot Summer. Um, McCord was an academic, a sociologist. He was also an activist participant in Freedom Summer. The third title that we have scheduled is uh, the Mississippi Black Paper, which was a collection of affidavits taken from uh, Mississippians and participants in Freedom Summer, organized, um, the, the book was by COFO, the Council of Federated Organizations. And we're <coughs> going to have additional titles a couple a year, we anticipate, in this Civil Rights in Mississippi series. Um, this afternoon, I'd, I'd like to tell you first a little about the story of the Hefner family and their fate, then about the context in which that story occurred, then something about Hotting Carter himself, and finally a few words about the aftermath and the broader significance of the story that Hotting Carter told. Um, so, what happened to the Hefner family? On Saturday, September 5, 1964, which was the Labor Day weekend, the family of there, the family of Albert W. Hefner, his friends called him Red, and um, his wife Mary Alva, friends called her Malva, they left their home at 202 Shannon Drive, a subdivision in Macomb, where they had lived for 10 years. Uh, they never lived in the town again. Um, on July 17th of that summer, they made a decision that would, within a few weeks, cost them their home and Red's job. The friends that they thought that they had made in the small southwest Mississippi city and their peace of mind. At the end of the summer, just after they left, Malva Hefner told a reporter, we've had it. You'll never know the hell that was in our hearts. In the eyes of their neighbors, their unforgettable sin 
was to have spoken on several occasions with civil rights workers in town, <clears throat> and finally to have invited two of them to their home for conversation. Both of those civil rights workers, Reverend Don McCord and Dennis Sweeney, were white, although that, that did not seem to lessen the shock of the Hefner's action to the town. On that evening of Friday, July 17th, as the Hefner's and Don McCord and Dennis Sweeney were discussing the summer voter registration project in Macomb, the Hefner's became aware that they were being watched and had been watched. The telephone at their house rang and an unidentified caller asked for Dennis Sweeney. And she asked him, how's the civil rights work going? After he realized the potentially dangerous nature of the call, Sweeney hung up the telephone. Later that evening, cars began circling the Hefner block, shining their lights into the Hefner home. Over the next few weeks, the anonymous telephone calls continued and became increasingly vulgar and threatening. Malvo recalled at the end of the summer that she had received something on the order of 300 harassing calls. People in the neighborhood if they weren't active participants in the intimidation campaign against them, were certainly aware of the dangers the Hefners faced. One afternoon, a four-year-old neighborhood boy asked Mrs. Hefner, when is your house going to be bombed? A reasonable question, perhaps, considering the level of violence in Macomb that summer. Red Hefner had seen his role only as a possible line of communication between respectable <clears throat> white home and the civil rights workers. He had informed George Guy, who was the chief of police and a man that he considered to be his friend, of his actions. He attempted to explain his reasoning to people in town. He thought that they would surely understand his desire to help keep matters calm in Macomb that summer. Instead, the community turned on them and the Hefners were despised, ostracized, suspected, and economically crippled, as a contemporary newspaper account put it. Now, the fall of the Hefners from the community's grace was swift and it was complete, and it demonstrates the power of fear and community pressure and many other kinds of pressures that kept so many white Mississippians from speaking out against conditions that prevailed too often in the state in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, So the Hefners Left Macomb is Carter's account of the fall of the Hefners. How could they, how did they become outcasts so quickly in the eyes of the community that had previously welcomed them? The Hefner, anybody in Macomb would have told you that the Hefners were respectable, and, and indeed they were more than respectable, they were respected. Um, Malva's first husband, Bob Nave, was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. Jan Nave, yeah, Jan Nave, Bob's daughter and Malva's, um, was a student at the W at the Mississippi uh, State College for Women, and she was completing her year as Miss Mississippi. And this was an era, of course, when Mississippi followed those pageants with a great vengeance. <laughs> um, Red and Malva's daughter, Carla, uh, was 17 that summer. She was probably less conventionally studious than her sister. She was a very serious reader and enjoyed writing. And Carter notes that even before the summer, she had, be, she had what he called a preoccupation with civil rights. Um, Carla, like her father, was given to outspokenness. Um, she was uh, <clears throat> generally popular in her high school class, the Macomb High class of 1965. Both Malva and Red had attended Ole Miss. Red had been honored. He worked for the Lincoln Mutual or Lincoln National Life Insurance Company. He had been honored by that company for his work. Macomb Civic Organizations had recognized Red Hefner and Malva as outstanding members of the community. They were active in their local Episcopal congregation, the Church of the Mediator. Perhaps that Episcopal affiliation 
was one of the few things that would have distinguished them <clears throat> from their mainly Baptist and Methodist neighbors. <clears throat> um, in, in writing the story of their exile, Hotting Carter wrote about people with whom he certainly identified. The Hefners were moderate. The Hefners were thoughtful. <clears throat> and the Hefners were in, interested in and invested in their community. But at the same time, they were essentially accepting that segregation was one of the realities of Southern life of the period, while they deplored vulgarity or violence in its defense. In other words, the Hefners were not outsiders, and the Hefners were not troublemakers until they came to be seen as so that summer. They were not the sort of troublemakers who found the trouble for which they came looking as some Mississippians said of that summer's civil rights workers. Shortly after they left Macomb, Malva Hefner told a reporter, if this could happen to us, it could happen to anyone. And I think that that stands as a very useful thesis for Hotting Carter's book as a whole. Now, as, as many of you are very well aware, Macomb's summer of 1964 took place within the broader context of the Mississippi Project, which was an effort coordinated by COFO, a coalition of civil rights groups that aimed to register black voters, to provide them access to civic and other basic forms of education, and generally to call attention to conditions in the state that was regarded, perhaps along with Alabama, as the one most likely to offer recalcitrant resistance to black efforts for civil rights, whether those efforts came from the courts, the national government, or from local activism. And in, in, indeed, again, as, as many of you here very well know, from the Emmett Till slaying through the assassination of Medgar Evers, Mississippi had provided evidence of the price that it was willing to exact to maintain the Jim Crow order in the state. Now, the national civil rights organizations that operated under the COFO umbrella that summer in 1963 and 1964 were officially committed to nonviolence, but they were also committed to the idea that Mississippi and other southern states uh, appeared ready to yield nothing without pressure and without visibility that they believed that their work could bring. That was a strategy that set them often at odds with the national NAACP and often at odds with black middle class and professional Mississippians who believed that strife might endanger their position both within the black community and in their dealings with local whites who recognized and indeed helped them to provide their status as respectable leaders. Now, the Mississippi Project brought about a thousand students and other volunteers to assist black Mississippians in attempting to gain their civil rights that summer. Given the state's high level of physical and emotional preparedness for the invasion, as the Jackson newspapers typically termed it, it's probably due in great measure to the savvy and experience of local black Mississippians that more student volunteers were not seriously injured or killed. And one of the safest generalizations to, to, to make about Macomb, Mississippi, is that few cities in the state experienced such a sustained and intense period of violence during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and that few places of comparable violent <coughs> resistance in the entire South have, until very recently, made less of an effort to reflect upon or come to terms with that fact. Now, as is true throughout much of the state, there are no statues in Macomb to commemorate the struggles of the 1960s. But there were no statues during the Hefner's time in Macomb to earlier wars either. Macomb was a relatively new place. It was a railroad town founded in 1872. There were no Faulknerian memories in marble or otherwise that might serve as markers of a Confederate past, of white redemption, <coughs> reconstruction, or anything else that might indicate a, a, a reserve of civil memory upon which a scene like the 1960s might have played out as one of those periodic challenges that arises 
and then is dealt with and then joins in a larger history of order triumphing over chaos. Now the lack of official public commemoration and discussion of the civil rights movement in Macomb is not because, as in nearby Brookhaven, 20 miles up the road, nothing of great value from the pre-1970 period seems to have been lost by local whites. That is to say, the lack of memorials and statues is not because the years in Macomb marked no significant events or significant changes. Indeed, in Macomb, elective politics and the schools and other similar areas of contestation have certainly accommodated black power, and that's a term that needs careful qualification in this context. Macomb has accommodated black power in ways that other cities in the state simply have not done as thoroughly or without a white retreat from the public schools or from the geographical boundaries of the community itself. Put simply, the Macomb schools and Macomb politics in the aftermath of the Hefner story became areas of active black participation and authority without generating the kind of retreat that marks many of the dreadfully depressed communities of the Delta or our own financially strapped capital city here. But this is not to say that Macomb is a model for reconciliation or a useful working relationship between whites and blacks more generally, because the circumstances that caused the disappearance of the memory of the Hefners, as well as a general amnesia in the white public at least of those years, is very contingent and specific, and just as contingent and specific as were the circumstances that led Macomb to drive away the Hefners in 1964. So, of the many ironies of Mississippi history, certainly a significant one, and I am speaking in retrospect as a, as a historian, um, has to do, and it's one of the luxuries of the trade, I suppose. Um, of the ironies of Mississippi history, certainly a significant one is that the aims of the summer project, the invasion that led to the Hefner's exile, the aims of that project were relatively modest and despite white fears to the contrary, were not revolutionary. The project aimed not at a real redistribution of power and resources, but rather for modest beginnings of black political participation. Mississippi at the period had the largest percentage of black citizens in the nation and had the smallest percentage of black registered voters, only about 6% in 1964. In 1964, when the Hefners were driven from Macomb, there's no Voting Rights Act yet. There was no federal sense of responsibility for the volunteers or for the civil rights of black Mississippians. And there was also no real mood of or tradition of open, violent efforts by black Mississippians to change Mississippi laws or customs. White Mississippians had little possibility, I believe, of seeing a real revolution come to the state that summer. <clears throat> White Mississippi still held a monopoly on state-sanctioned force. The laws of Mississippi still offered little protection to anyone that locally powerful people or violent vigilantes wish to punish. And just as important, the bulk of the white volunteers who came to Mississippi still believed that America might work as the civics textbooks suggested that it should, or less cynically, that America was a society that could be called upon to listen to the better angels of its nature. Certainly, most black Mississippians knew better than that. The summer of 1964 would prove an education for most of the volunteers as well as the Hefners. Now, Macomb, in the 1960s, had a tradition of black civil rights activism that still seeks good, full treatment by a historian. In Pike County and in neighboring Amit County, blacks long had quietly, as far as their white neighbors knew, worked to accumulate property and land, operate small businesses such as hotels and restaurants and venues for black performing artists, and to challenge their status in the face of white resistance and often the threat, always the threat of violence. Now Macomb, unlike other Mississippi cities, did not witness 
the familiar civil rights era drama of black citizens running a hostile gauntlet of a white crowd to a centrally located courthouse fronted by a Confederate monument, in part because Macomb was not the county seat of Pike County. Magnolia was, and so there was the courthouse. But black voter registration activities <coughs> were no secret to the sheriff or to the political and business powers of Macomb. But the bulk of white Macomb citizens, and this I think is one of the reasons why the events of 1964 provoked such um, concern and violence from Macomb, the bulk of white Macomb citizens simply did, had not witnessed voter registration activities, pickets, and other forms of resistance, let alone the outside agitators that 1964 brought. In other words, it was perhaps easy as it was in other Mississippi communities for whites to imagine that black Macomb was basically content with its lot. Now, by the time Hodding Carter, sorry. there we are. By the time Hodding Carter wrote his book on Macomb, he had earned a national reputation as a moderate or even a progressive newspaper editor. Now, Carter was born in Macomb, or sorry, Carter was born in Louisiana, as, as many of you know. Um, he had made his reputation a news, as a newspaper editor first here in Mississippi and then um, later in Louisiana. He had, he had been trained at Columbia University School of Journalism. He um, was, had been educated, uh, um, his undergraduate degree was from Bowdoin College in Maine. He worked first as a reporter in New Orleans, other Louisiana cities, then briefly in Jackson. Then he founded with his wife, the former Betty Werlein, the Hammond, Louisiana Daily Courier. Now the paper quickly developed a reputation as a scourge of the Huey Long administration, which was not a unique newspaper stand in the state at the time, because the New Orleans papers had been critical of Long since his entry into politics as a critic of the oil and gas and other, other moneyed interests in the state. Carter's criticism of Long, however, rested upon a rich and growing body of evidence that the Kingfish not only ran Louisiana as his fiefdom, which a few doubted and many people applauded, but that he used particularly venal and corrupt and, and violent means to hold power and to silence his critics. Now, Carter was a substantial man and defended his paper and himself with strong language and occasionally um, with larger caliber weapons, which is very much in the tradition of the sometimes raucous Southern press. Now, whether opposition to Huey Long was progressive or moderate or even conservative is, I think, somewhat pointless to ask, but it was brave and it was certainly dangerous. The Carters relocated to Greenville, Mississippi, which was a very cosmopolitan town for its size. Um, Several generations of the Percy families and a young Shelby Foote um, were there at the time the Carters established their paper, uh, which was the Greenville Democrat Times, which was later edited by his son and then his, his grandson. Now, the paper was never deliberately provocative in the manner of, say, Hazel Brannon Smith here in Mississippi or Harry Golden in North Carolina. But his paper was very influential, and it survived the displeasure of some of his readers and much of the state's political leadership. Um, now, those <coughs> excuse me, those qualities are worth noting, especially in the light of subsequent criticism of Carter as a moderate, that is, a person who did not stake more advanced uh, positions on African American civil rights than he did. Um, Carter's record. Um, is admirable. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1946 for editorials criticizing America's treatment of Japanese American World War II veterans. And in the 1950s, he strongly denounced the Citizens Council in the national press and in its own paper at a time when the organization enjoyed great and growing power in the state. And there was nothing meek or nothing moderate in those days about attacking the Citizens Council. Um, but it's perhaps in his growing role of native 
of interpreter and, in, and observer of the South to the nation that Carter is perhaps vulnerable to charges that he represented a line of thinking that is now somewhat discredited. That counsel was patience. Patience with the White South as it was allowed time to work out its own solution to matters like school segregation and the larger claims of the emerging civil rights movement. By the mid-60s, Carter's advice to be patient and to wait for the South to reform its own soul and institutions seemed obsolete. But Carter, in his defense, was not the only white Southerner to not to find an easy way out of that trap. Two things I have to say in Carter's defense. His moderation never seemed a cover for doing nothing. And second, we have become little better in the last half century in confronting the fierce urgency of now, as Martin Luther King put it. There were more, much more discreditable stands in the White South in those days and in that, in that era than suggesting that the region was not yet prepared for the kinds of sacrifices that reform demanded and that the broader American nation itself showed itself no more ready than the Deep South to face. Nowhere in Carter's book on the Hefners does he suggest that the Hefners themselves acted too hastily. Nowhere does he say that anyone's interests could have been better served if Macomb had simply been allowed to cool off for a spell so that the hotheads on both sides, as Carter never put it to his credit, could be persuaded to leave and allow the people of goodwill to work out things on, his own, on their own terms. Now, Carter did not set out to write the book as a criticism of the Council of Moderation and Gradualism, though that is a message that emerges from the pages of the book. Because if people like the Hefners, as respected as they were, could not so much as seek to hear what white civil rights workers had to say for themselves, what a mockery it is to suggest that the South in due time might simply have <coughs> awakened to a sense of moderation. If white Mississippians with a record of respectability such as that of the Hefners could be so late quickly labeled as outsiders and as traitors, what hope for anyone more legitimately considered an outsider and a traitor? And if the professional classes of Macomb showed so little power of resistance to violence and indeed seemed to have sanctioned the ostracism of the family, what must that say about the potential poverty of Atticus Finch-like heart-by-heart reform of the South in the 1960s? Now, the tragic career of Red Hefner, more than those of Atticus Finch, more than that even of James Meredith or Medgar Evers, contains neglected lessons, hard lessons, unsuited for easy digestion by school children about the limits of the individual heart and individual action in affecting change upon what the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr called moral man in immoral society. Now, C.C. Bryant, who is a local Macomb businessman and activist, recalled that the city of Macomb in 1964 was a hell on earth which is a phrase that's now inscribed on the Freedom Trail monument that was placed in July of 2014 in Macomb. Um, by almost any measure, the city of Macomb experienced great and sustained violence. Now, Oxford and Philadelphia and Jackson figure more largely in histories of the civil rights era in Mississippi. That may be because of the absence at least in the eyes of Hollywood or documentary filmmakers because of the absence of a singular figure like James Meredith around which to build a story or the presence of martyrs such as the three Philadelphia lynching victims. <clears throat> Given the amount of bombing and shooting in Pike County and Macomb in 1964, it's not for lack of trying that violent men in Macomb failed to kill people. Indeed, the level of visible, property-damaging violence in Macomb became so great. Let me see. Here's a partial list compiled by civil rights workers. The list is seven pages of this sort. Beginning in April, this goes through July. 
Albert Hefner House surrounded by vigilante committee, mm -hmm. COPO headquarters bombed, um, Curtis C.C. Bryant's home bombed, Freddie Bates' home bombed. You can see the evening of June 22nd was a busy one. Mm -hmm. As I said, there are about seven single space pages like this of events from that summer in Macomb. Um, rumors swept through town that President Lyndon Johnson was preparing to declare martial law in the city. Now, whether or not those rumors proved to have much foundation, the local newspaper, which was the Enterprise Journal, edited by Oliver Emery here, began to call for order, which, as we have been reminded again in recent years, is not precisely the same thing as arguing that homicidal bombers should receive justice. Now, in November <clears throat> of 1964, the newspaper ran a statement of principles, which was drafted by a committee of businessmen and signed by more than 650 white city residents, many of them doctors and dentists, business owners, members of the town's most noted families. Many of the points spelled out in the statement of principles seem very basic. Um, all arrests should be made for legitimate reasons, the statement holds, which attests to the broad authority that law enforcement officers in the period possessed. Another provision of the statement suggested that public office holders should not be members of subversive organizations, such as the Ku Klux Klan. But the statement is little more than that, a statement, since it did not call for or lead to any structural changes, let alone clear amelioration of many black residents' basic grievances, nor did it end the bombing, as some people in the city still claim. Instead, the statement is perhaps best understood as a commentary on the possibilities that White Macomb believed in that summer. This call for an end to future recourse to extra-legal organized violence came late, too late for the Hefners, of course, and came only in the company of a large enough and prominent enough group to ensure that no one seemed conspicuous by inclusion. Now, as Chris mentioned, I am a native of Macomb. Two of my grandparents signed the Statement of Principles. One was a grocer and his wife. Two of my grandparents did not sign the Statement of Principles. Um, my grandmother owned a beauty shop on Delaware Avenue where I lived as a child. Now, few of the signers spoke publicly about their decision to endorse the statement. The dissenters did not either. The Statement of Principles reveals, I think, the caution with which the respectable people of the town approached the summer's violence. Now, the fact that the summer project was over before the statement was published also speaks to the alleged power of the city people to do something. If these doctors and businessmen and other professionals could not do something, who could? If they would not, does the statement mean anything? In their defense, it is always easier to demand of the past that people should do something than it is to consider how confusing and daunting it is to live through a social revolution. In any case, returning maybe to firmer ground, the Macomb Statement commits a logical error as common in our time as in theirs, the fallacy of the false mill. The signatories called on extremists of both sides to calm down and cool off, a position that in another place in the South Martin Luther King had memorially, had uh, memorably demolished in the letter from Birmingham jail. The closest that the statement comes to revealing troubling injustice within the community is the provision that holders of public office ought not to be members of groups that had been identified as, by national authorities as subversive organizations. Now, the statement was published in November. All but a few of the summer workers had left Mississippi, the Atlantic City Democratic Convention in August had failed to produce a seating of the Mississippi Freedom Party delegation. The presidential election had occurred. Republican candidate Barry Goldwater received over 90% of the votes that were cast and counted in Macomb. 
and the Hefners had left Macomb and Mississippi as well. Now, what then of the broader significance of Red Hefner's story? Ultimately, Red Hefner acted simply as a civic-minded man, one who deplored violence not only as bad for business in the community and the reputation of the town, but one who also saw it as the act of the lowest form of power. In the end, as it turned out, the Hefners were indeed victims of people who hid their faces from them one way or another. What about Macomb and the Hefner family after the family was driven from town in the fall of 1964? The city's story is, in some ways, the easier one to tell. Now, the bombings and other attempts at assassination and other violent suppression of the civil rights movement ended without federal or state intervention or any dramatic incident. Yet in the first few decades after Freedom Summer, when the violence of 1964 and the broader period was remembered at all by white citizens in the town, it was as a story of the responsible people of the town taking a stand and reclaiming the city from those violent men who wanted to make something of the town other than what it truly was. <coughs> those who had signed the Enterprise Journal's Statement of Principles, as well as the paper's editor, Oliver Emmerich, were remembered as people who poured balm on troubled waters and turned out the extremists. It's a reassuring story, not entirely true in my estimation, but one can understand why many white Macomb people would have wanted to think so. In the aftermath of the bombing, uh, a handful of men were arrested and tried for their part in that summer's reign of terror. Most of them were working class with jobs as mechanics or for the Illinois Central Railroad. One, though, the name at the top of the list, was a troubled and criminally inclined son of one of Macomb's financial first families. At their trial, the men received suspended or incredibly light punishments. Um, many of these, and, and the, the, the sentences were light, the judge said, because of the youth of the men. And many of these, many of these callow youth, one notes, were in their 30s. Um, and it goes without saying that such punishments to fit such crimes reflected something, I think, other than current Mississippi philosophy about the most effective ways to rehabilitate youth. Indeed, at the sentencing, the judge announced that the men had been unduly provoked by agitators of low morals and hygiene. Um, now, in the 1970s and 80s, in the aftermath of the Hefner story, the most fundamental common topic of political conversation for a generation in Mississippi, the necessity to preserve the foundation of the Mississippi way of life, had passed out of open discourse. In Macomb in the 1970s and 80s, the <coughs> civil rights movement did not dominate the local newspaper, except as it played out in court cases at various levels and in the enforcement of the decisions of those courts. It was often easy not to dwell on the fact that the summer campaign of 1964 had even occurred. Now, in recent years, Macomb has joined other Mississippi towns in beginning to commemorate the civil rights struggles of the 1960s. In cooperation with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, signs in the city now mark physical landmarks and key participants in that era. C.C. Bryant's House and Business, Aileen Quinn's Restaurant and Home, for example, and others are scheduled to join them. One can even take a driving tour of the city keyed to homes, churches, businesses, and other sites of significance to the black community's efforts to secure civil rights. What of the Hefners themselves? None of them ever lived in Macomb again. Red and Malva are both dead, and they died before it became fashionable or correct to offer apologies or any kind of recognition of their losses from that time. However, it's not easy to say what form such an apology might take, because they were not punished by arrest or any kind of official city action that could be rescinded or expunged from any record. 
Their persecution came at the hands of men and women who for the most part lived out their lives in the town respected or forgotten for what they did at that time, or at least never called in any meaningful way to account for what they did. Red and Malva, especially Malva, expressed regret and sadness at their fate. Neither ever expressed hatred for Macomb or for the people who terrorized or ostracized them. And neither of them, at the time or later, offered anything like an apology or a recantation of their actions in attempting to understand what was happening in their city that summer. Now the two sisters, Jan and Carla, maintained the same sort, have maintained the same sort of divergence over the years that they had shown during their adolescence. Jan, the former Miss, Miss Mississippi, was over the years the quieter of the two, rarely speaking of the family's fate or taking a stand of any <coughs> kind on the events of the Civil Rights Movement. Carla, on the other hand, after finishing her high school education in Washington, D.C., with the aid of the Episcopal Church, the Hefners had relocated to suburban Hyattville, Maryland. Carla studied at Sarah Lawrence College. She eventually left not only Mississippi, but the United States as well. She settled in Europe, eventually married a member of British Parliament, and according to a Macomb memoirist, Mac Gordon, Carla has issued a standing invitation to her former Macomb High classmates to hold a class reunion at her and her husband's baronial ancestral home. <laughs> In the spring of 1997, her father died there of cancer. Malva died also of cancer in 1995. Now here at the 50th anniversary of the most important events in Macomb, in, in Mississippi's civil rights struggle, the saga of the Hefners remains relatively unknown. No plaques, no documentaries, and very little in the historical examinations of those years marks their story. Compared with other Mississippians, their fate at least does not involve a cold case murder. Still, the silence over Macomb and the Hefner family is striking. No activist, from Bob Moses to any of the Freedom Summer volunteers, can think of the city of Macomb without recalling the open campaign of bombing in 1964. The story of the Hefners was not punctuated with a murder, as in Philadelphia, or a riot, as in Oxford. That fact complicates its dramatic telling as a story. The story of the Hefners is important and revealing and should not be relegated to a brief sentence or two as it is in many of the civil rights histories of Mississippi. Why should the Hefner story loom larger than it does? After all, the great migration of black Mississippians from the Deep South to other parts of the United States is no better and often far worse than what happened to the Hefners, and it's not cynicism to say so. The Hefner story matters because of what it says about community about belonging, about violence, and participation in guilt, in the maintenance and unraveling of the Jim Crow order. Black Macomb citizens were constantly aware of the forms of power in the city and the consequences they were liable to face if they transgressed Jim Crow laws or community mores. The Hefners were first the beneficiaries and then the victims of that system of power and control. It's been a hard pill for Mississippians to swallow, but it's nevertheless the truth that white Mississippians had the luxury of noticing or not noticing race as the occasion <clears throat> demanded. Nostalgic recollections of the old days in Macomb and other southern communities can afford to forget Jim Crow because whites were allowed not to think about it. This is not precisely the same thing as saying that every white person carries guilt from those years or benefited tangibly from the subordination of black citizens, although the latter is true. We do not make history in the ways that textbooks and popular culture suggest that we can. People of Macomb went about their getting and spending and lives and religious devotions, asking mostly that tomorrow might be better than today and at least no worse. <laughs> 
and considerations of responsibility are meaningless if one does not draw a distinction between those people and those who planted dynamite, between the people who planted dynamite and those who wished only to live their lives without getting involved one way or another, as did surely the bulk of the white population in Macomb, including my grandparents and the two high school students that summer who would become my parents in 1965. To demand that any of them should have done something about the conditions that prevailed that summer in the years leading up to it is to ask more of them than most of us ask of ourselves. But Southern whites of those years and later, those years and later must understand that Jim Crow operated in Macomb in a direct, invisible, often violent fashion on the black citizens of the community and the legacies of those years and the failure forthrightly to remember and confront them has something to do with the problems we face today. Finally, the story of the Hefners, this is their house, 202 Shannon Drive in Macomb, two years ago. Finally, the story of the Hefners shows how fragile and how strong, at the same time, the bonds of white community were in the Jim Crow South, and in many ways, so they remain. In what amounted to an instant, what the Hefners believed about responsibility and belonging turned on them. It's not too much to ask that in the chronicles of the Jim Crow years in Mississippi, it's remembered that the Hefners suffered too. I talked longer than I intended to do. Um, if anyone has questions or comments, I would love to entertain them. Yes. Did any of your research reveal the identities of law enforcement officers in that area who were actually members of the Klan? Um, George Guy, the chief of police, was involved with the um, Association for the Preservation of the White Race, which is um, so yes. <laughs> and the Highway Patrol? The Highway Patrol doesn't have the kind of story that one can find, say, in Neshoba County. Mm -hmm. okay. um, members of the Macomb Police Department, sheriff's deputies as well, <clears throat> were rumored to and did have affiliations with vigilante organizations, so yes. I was a 24-year-old student living in Macomb during that time, and we could not go to law enforcement with any of our complaints because we knew uh, that they were Klansmen. Yeah. So who do you complain to? Who do you look to for protection? You couldn't find it there. And um, the, the um, as, and I don't mean to pick on George Guy, the, the former police chief, but Red Hefner, believed Guy to be a, more than an acquaintance, he believed he was his friend, who went to him and said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk with these people who are coming into town, and I don't want it to be misunderstood. Um, Carter points out, well points out in, in his book, that when Guy was later asked by Macomb people whether Hefner had had such a conversation with him, he denied it. Yes, sir. Uh, historians are preoccupied with the past. Yes. But I wonder if you have a message for people living like yourself in the present and in the future. Um, certainly, yes. I mean, the, the, I believe that, as I, as I tried to say toward the end, I think that we don't do, um, we don't do anyone any favors to try to pretend that the past was any simpler than it was, that, that, that moral issues were, uh, had a clarity that they, that they don't have today. As I said, people living through periods of social change mainly want to be okay, mainly want for their lives to be okay, and are mainly trying to figure out how to understand what's happening in a world that, where fundamental things appear to be in motion. Um, 
and I try to let that keep me humble as I write, um, not, to, not to say they ought to have done, they should have seen, didn't they know, um, but because you know, we then have to be prepared for, the, for people to ask the thing, things about us you know, in a quarter century or a half century. I mean, we do the best that we can, um, and um, you know, we, are, we are morally responsible for our actions, although um, you know, we get up in the morning, we do what we can, the next day we try to do better than we did the, the, the previous day, um, but we have to understand that as historically contingent beings, we all inherit the historical tradition. We are not as much individuals as we, as we wish to think. Um, we, we come of age and work and, and, and go about our business in a community that's shaped by the actions that people before us took. And it's no good um, um, saying that that happened before I was born or um, that was a long time ago. Um, and that's one of the reasons I, 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 I've enjoyed writing more recently about things that are um, um, within living memory because um, um, I do believe that um, the, while, the, while the questions or while the answers to the questions may not be easy, uh, we are particularly obligated to look to the recent past and to try to understand how it shapes what we live in now. There. Yes, sir. Uh, would you say that there is was more racial violence and Klan activity in South Mississippi than in North Mississippi or the Delta? And if so, why is that? I'm not going to wait for that. Without meaning, without being flipped, let me say that there was violence of plenty throughout the state, no region had a monopoly on it, no region seems more predisposed than, than any other. Um, my sense in working on southern Mississippi, on southwest Mississippi, particularly Macomb, is that because Macomb was not that old, because Macomb, one of the, one of the interesting things about, let me, let me answer your question, I don't believe that um, as you saw from the list, you know, that, that documents the violence in Macomb, um, not every community had activists who were, who were uh, compiling such lists. Many communities could, could, could uh, demonstrate such a list of violence. So I don't mean to pick particularly, I don't think Macomb people are any more, uh, I don't think Macomb people were any more prone to violence. Um, the newspapers had told them an invasion was coming. Even Oliver Emmerich's Enterprise Journal characterized, he, he used the word invasion in, in ed editorials written at the beginning of the summer, telling, uh, counseling patients and, and calm, but called it an invasion. And as, and as we see uh, every day, rhetoric matters, you know, what you call, how you characterize a, an opponent or an event. Um, can suggest what you need to do about that opponent or about that event. And so people in Mississippi, people in Macomb, um, what, do you, what does one do with an invader? One, one expels the invader because he threatens things that are to be cherished. <coughs> um, Macomb, let me say this, I did not mention this. Um, you know, Macomb had the shop for the southern end of the Illinois Central Line. And I think that that is very important in understanding why Macomb's story unfolded the way that it did. Um, um, the jobs were union jobs, the jobs were, were so, so black Macomb men were not as vulnerable to the kinds of economic pressures as, as, were, as were men in um, um, other cities. And um, um, the first time I ever heard of a railroad pass was um, from one of my grandparents who told me that they can use those things and go other places where they get funny ideas. <laughs> um, I have a great deal of respect for my grandmother, but that was how I remember precisely how she, that, that, you know, that, that with that Illinois Central Pass, Black Macomb men could go places, see things done differently, and come back with what struck many people there as funny ideas. Um, 
and the um, so I don't I don't I don't think that Macomb was um, it, you know Macomb had a level of violence that is just you know, you know dumbfounding. Don Edwards, who was a U.S. rep from California, was in Macomb in 1964. His son was one of the volunteers. He called the Justice Department and he said that he was in Macomb and um, he said, no, you're not. So yes, I am. He said, you should get out of there. <laughs> um, and his response was that, don't we see a problem, I'm paraphrasing, or don't we see a problem that if, if you're telling me it's not safe for me to be here, you know, do, do, isn't that evidence of a problem that needs some attention from y'all? Yes? Yeah, I was interested in uh, your comment that uh, Barry Goldwater got 90% of the white vote in 1964 in Mississippi. In Macomb. Oh, in Macomb. So it wasn't quite that high statewide. Uh, My recollection is not, but Pike County, um, to said the votes that were cast and counted. So well, some claims don't change over 50 years because 50 years later, 90% of white people in Mississippi still vote Republican. <laughs> the, um, or 92%, I think. <laughs> but I can't give you the gold water, but the, the gold water is like the big numbers. Yeah, but he started to switch over. 87, Governor Winter says. He started to switch over to Republican, Mississippi being Republican, yeah. and the white majority. Yeah. I, don't, I don't suggest a connection between the summer violence and the, and the, and the vote for Barry Goldwater, but the, you know, Macomb, it was over 90%. Yes, sir. Yeah, more just a comment than anything. Um, you, know, you talk about why was Macomb so violent, but also you cross a very close border into a mid county. Oh, uh, yes. It's very violent, and of course, Joanne Moody wrote a wonderful book, Coming of Age in Mississippi. So I think it's a matter of looking at uh, migration patterns from the Carolinas and the Mississippi and, and uh, some of the populations where they settle, and you see more violence in some areas in Mississippi, and some of it can be traced back to the the, the migration pattern. Yeah. Well, and as the congressman suggested, I mean, southwest Mississippi was um, a very dangerous place and a very recalcitrant place. And I don't want to suggest, well, all Mississippi was everything. All, all Mississippi was problematic. Southwest Mississippi had a well deserved and well earned reputation for, for violence, for violent resistance. For law enforcement being um, hand in glove with that violent resistance. Sign my capital. Yeah. A huge percentage were, were immigrants from North Carolina. Uh -huh. And some from Virginia, but basically North Carolina. All of my relatives from North Carolina. Which is where my Pike County ancestors come from, you know, from North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I don't know, I'm not going to wade into the. Which is the chair of the state of North Carolina? Yes. We could go. Well, right. You said that we do the best we can, and we know that when you know better, you do better. But you also said Mississippi is willing to pay the price exacted of it. Why is that? Sir, um, yes, I believe that. Back up and make sure I'm understanding what you said. Um, I believe, and, and my goal is to wake up <coughs> and, and, and do better today than I did yesterday. Um, and I believe that the bulk of people do what they think is right by the lights that they have. They may be misdirected, but that they do what they think they should be doing. And that, that's the spirit in which I try to approach writing about the past. But you said Mississippi is willing to. You said Mississippi is willing to pay the price exacted of its stance. No, I think that Mississippi was. I may have been speaking. I don't. I, well, I, go. I'm sorry. Why is it? Why is Mississippi that willing? when we know better, we do better, and we have learned better. We should be learning from the past. But why is it Mississippi insists on holding to the past? I see. Um, because it's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, just to, to, to take the context here for a moment, when you've grown up, and, and I think it's, it's vital to remember, if you, if you were, you know, like my parents, teenagers in the mid-60s, you'd grown up at a time 
when from from the pulpit, from the newspapers, from from the schools, from 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 most politicians, you had heard of that the Mississippi way of life was threatened. And this is what white Mississippians. It was very difficult to grow up as a white Mississippian in, the, in those years. Even if you re, even if you rejected the proposition, you, you, this is this is what you heard constantly. Um, and so when people believe that the things that they value, church, family, um, are threatened, they're liable to do darn near anything to try to protect or preserve them. And so um, I, I, I say that people, people try to do the best that they can, and that can include doing some very bad things if they believe that they're protecting their family, their faith, their, their, their community. Um, and that's, I think, what makes it what makes it complicated. You may not be answering your door. You know, why do Mississippians do the things that they do? Um, I don't believe we're, we're, we're worse. There are black families as well. There are black lives. There's yeah. black education. There are black lives. Yeah. And Mississippi continues to demonstrate that those lives are not as valuable. So <clears throat> in the prism of history, yeah. why is that? Because we've had a difficulty in Mississippi establishing a post Jim Crow sense of community, because we've had a, we have, we've had difficulty framing definitions of community that embrace all Mississippians. Um, we, when 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 you hear the words "we" and "our" and "they" being used in political discourse in the state, other states other places to this day. Those definitions are very often rooted in um, um, racially, or racial particulars. So and we're still resistant from learning from the experiences of others. I, we and all bringing are. bringing in the best of what we see others achieve. We're resistant. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm, 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 uh, Absolutely. Thank you. You can go out. <laughs> yes. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.